Amara, who's a consultant for ClickUp, is joining us today to talk about project management. And before we dive into her presentation, <laughs> which, by the way, uh, talks about four out of five issues I've had myself with project management, and I, I've really, 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 really had some get got some gray hairs from those <laughs> situations. So I, I am very happy and uh, very lucky that, that I'm on this panel and I get to ask questions to Amara. But before we dive into that, let's uh, make a round ar around the room here and let's have ourselves introduce us. So we'll start with Picha, then I'll go and we'll leave it to Amara to finish up this introduction round. All right. Hello, I am Peach Neri, and I am a designer and UX and design consultant. And I am, of course, a cloud-based maverick. And Jan, you're a liar. You don't have any gray hair. I have more. <laughs> <laughs> If you only knew, Peach. <laughs> like here on the sides, it's getting really gray. That's for sure. So <laughs> I'll believe <laughs> it when I see it. Of the camera. Oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah, clever. And you've cleverly adjusted the, the depth of field so that we can't see the high yeah. res on the temples. Okay, okay. Yeah. As if I knew what I was doing here, yeah. Funny. <laughs> so my, my name is Jan Koch. I've taken over Virtual Summit Mastery. I'm diving full on into organizing virtual summits, teaching you how to organize virtual summits. And I'm a cloud-based maverick. And of course, I'm one of the two male mavericks we usually have. Big shout out to Lee Matthew Jackson from Agency Trailblazer, who can't be with us today. But um, therefore, we have our amazing guest, Amara. Hi, everyone. My name is Amara. I am the CEO of Amara Reps. We are a digital marketing agency located here in sunny Long Beach, California. Um, without further ado, I can go ahead and hop in. So do you have an intro slide? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So, there we go. Over to you, Amara. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about the five project management problems for agencies. And so just to kind of give you all a little bit of background, um, like I said, we're a growth agency here in Long Beach, California. I um, hate to use a, you know, I hate to use terminology that um, everybody uses these days when talking about marketing growth. However, um, we've been doing fractional CMO services for the last 12, 13 years. Um, we have over 40 active clients, about 200 um, or so uh, past and present clients. Um, we're a team of 12. Um, we do uh, web development, content marketing, SEO, media buying, strategy, consulting, sales enablement, design, and branding. Um, we really take care of the full funnel of our, we take care of the full funnel for our clients um, end to end. So um, as you can imagine, and today, if you guys have any questions with regards to how to manage any of these items in ClickUp, I would love to answer and tell a little bit more about how we overcome our challenges when managing all these different types of projects, the different types of campaigns, um, and different things for our clients. So let's jump right in. So problem number one that agencies typically face is software fatigue. And let me explain a little bit about that. I'm going to embarrassingly say that I've paid for and used every single one of these platforms. ClickUp, Teamwork, Basecamp, Mavenlink, ProofUp, Trello, Excello, Asana, Reich. And even more important, I've used probably, you know, a lion's share of the extensions that go along with and, and integrations that go along with these um, project management platforms. Um, to try to make them work. So time time tracking solutions, invoicing software, uh, reporting software, you name it, right? So for me, it was software fatigue because I kept jumping around from uh, platform to platform, trying to figure out which platform is gonna you know, be the silver bullet and help me better understand how to manage my team, my projects, give me insights on profitability, um, help me understand where I'm, you know, maybe not scoping my projects properly. Maybe I'm, you know, my processes aren't clear. I was hoping for the software to be my Oracle, to be the thing that got me uh, to the promised land. And the one thing I will say is that a huge, it's a huge myth. And hopefully by the time we get done with this presentation, you'll better understand 
that the problem is not actually the software. As much as I love ClickUp, um, I do use ClickUp. It is the my primary tool of choice. Tool of choice. It is the one that I've landed on. It's the one that I use. It's the one that I consult other agencies on. Um, it is not the software. It is absolutely not the software. We'll get into what it is in just a little bit here. Um, so if you've had that experience, if you've been trying to hop from software to software to software, uh, my word of advice to you is to look at some of the other issues that I'm going to address today and try to, um, before you start evaluating different softwares, look at your processes and look at the different things that we're going to talk about today and see if you're having those same problems before you start to uh, pick apart and try to uh, make some of these softwares your own and integrate them into your business, whether you're an agency, marketing department, um, software company, et cetera, et cetera. Oops. All right, problem number two is a lack of standardization, um, which leads to the trickle down issue of making it impossible to run reports and analyze data. Um, to, and, and this, we only have, I'm only gonna talk about uh, click up in project manager for about 30 minutes and leave it open for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'm only gonna go over two of the hundreds of issues that come from a lack of standardization. One of the biggest issues is, that I find with agencies and marketing departments is that everybody wants to do things their own way. Since they don't have standards in place, every project manager wants to do things their way. They want to, every time a new project manager starts at an agency, they wanna revamp the whole project management process so that they can see things um, the way they want to and it works the way things, the way that they want. And you know, I don't have, a, I'm not against project managers in any way, shape or form, but if you're an agency owner and you've hired a bunch of project managers, um, you probably feel that frustration that um, there's a lack of standardization. It's systems and project management ends up revolving around a person versus a standard versus um, a clear cut way of doing things. So you can never truly evaluate if your systems are actually working, um, how to you know, tighten up holes, how to um, optimize your system. Therefore, it also makes it impossible to run reports and analyze data. Um, a couple other uh, issues of standardization is quite simply just making a task, right? Everybody makes tasks differently. So if you've never used ClickUp, this is what um, it looks like when you're making a task, minus this little timer here that says start timer. That's the integration that I use um, for our time tracking so that we can um, get better insights into our uh, estimating, our workload, our uh, utilization of our, of, our, um, of our teams, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I use an a, a extension to, um, to manage that or an integration to manage that and give me better insights. But um, every single person on a team ends up providing and creating tasks differently. So if you don't standard some of the standardize some of the basic things like creating a task, um, a lot of times you're you're stuck in uh, never ending loops of of miscommunication. People not being able to find their tasks. People spending more time trying to manage this the actual project management system um, than actually using it to streamline and solidify their work. Um, so, so at our agency, um, we make sure that these seven things are on every single task at minimum and all the other stuff is just extra, right? We have a yeah. very clear handoff system. We have a very clear um, statuses and so on and so forth. Uh, did you have it's a question? Yeah, it's, it sounds very familiar with, with that aspect of, of everybody creating tasks differently. And I was wondering if you have like uh, a formula, if you want, for crafting the perfect task, because you say uh, those seven points are very important. But for example, what does a, what does a good task headline look like? There's so many oh. different ways to, to write just the headline. Don't get me started on the description itself. <laughs> so we're, I'm actually implementing a, a, a system for this within our company. I'm just kind of revamping it a little bit. But I mean, when creating a task, right, that's just, the, um, within ClickUp you have your space, right? And for, for us, I think actually I have that, oops, here. Um, your space, which for us is our client. We don't do clients within the folders. We use um, spaces to manage a client because it's the most flexibility, right? Um, and within those folders, that ends up being our project. And our project actually um, is one of two things. And if you're an agency, you kind of might understand this. You have 
you might have retainers, right? Where you have ongoing services and then you might have one-off projects. We have that all the time where we have like a marketing retainer with the client. Maybe they want to redo their website or maybe we're um, doing a mailer. That's a one-off of what we normally do every month. Um, so from a billing standpoint, that's a nightmare. And we'll go through that in a late, we'll go through that later because you don't know how to separate it out. You're time tracking for everything. It just kind of balls up into one big clump. So that's why we separate our actual contracts, our quote unquote invoices, um, things that we bill separately into different folders. And so that's how we ideate that and separate that. So there's alignment um, with billing and our administrative side. And then you have lists. So within those lists, you have, um, we use those lists to kind of break up the type of tasks that we're working with. So before we talked about um, all the different areas in which we provide services, strategy, web development, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually label our lists based on those service types that we have so that we can actually drill down later and see which services are most profitable, which types of services are more profit most profitable um, from a high level, right? Um, and then, then there's other ways to, to dig down a little bit deeper. And so within those lists, you have tasks. So let me go back to my oops, tasks um, screen. Um, within that, you have your task, right? And so uh, from there, you can actually create tasks, you can create subtasks, and now you can create sub subtasks. So when naming those tasks, I like to um, there's a couple different ways to do it. You have milestones, right? And so milestones are important because you can use those in uh, Gantt view. So if you like Gantt charts and things like that, um, you can convert your, your main tasks to Gantt. So if you have a task, like for example, we do a lot of webinars for our clients and we have about 20 something tasks for each webinar just to ex execute a basic webinar. So instead of creating 20 different tasks within our space, we create our main task, which is the milestone. And we usually make that do the date that the webinar happens. And then all everything underneath that becomes a, a subtask or a sub subtask, right? So we name the uh, task, our, we have a naming convention for our, for our webinars, for example, which is the, um, the name of the webinar. Um, and then we use the date just in case we do that topic again or a similar topic. Um, and then, uh, so that's number one. Number two is the description. So you want to make sure that we have um, some sort of SOP within our tasks. So we usually put SOP information in that description, um, helpful information, background, um, approved copy, et cetera, et cetera, within that within that area. Uh, so that's where we, we put that information. Um, number three, we want to make sure we have um, a time estimate. We want to know if we're estimating enough time for our tasks to be completed. And so um, right, wrong, or indifferent, we put an estimate on every task. That's mandatory. And then we're also counting backwards from our retainers and our scope of works to make sure we don't go over budget. Um, and so as we get more efficient, obviously, we start to go on, you know, uh, do projects under budget. And that's where profitability happens, right? When you've got repeatable systems in place and you're doing things much faster um, and better. However, uh, in the, you know, phenomenal world of marketing, things change. Zoom changes every other month, for example, um, things might change. And so that number might start to go up as technology changes. So we constantly want to be monitoring that. So that's why we make it a, a mandatory to put an uh, estimate in there. Um, and then number four would be a due date. We always have a due date if it's a task that um, spans over multiple days. Um, especially for a milestone, we use start date and due date. So at minimum, we need to have a due date on there. Um, I think number five accidentally got misplaced, but you see where it says um, open. <laughs> uh, that's where the status is. We make sure that um, for our for project managers, they're the ones that pretty much manage one through seven. But we make sure that our team um, only touches two things. I'm sorry, three things. Their time tracking, the status, and then leaving comments on the task. Everything else is handled by the project manager so that our team isn't wasting time trying to figure out how to craft tasks. Um, uh, number six is priority. So what ends up happening is uh, when every everything might have a due date, but some things have higher priority. So if something is due uh, within 24 hours, we give it a red flag. If it's due within 72 hours, we give it an orange flag. If it's got a blue, um, 
flag, we give it, you know, it's just due normally based on its due date. And if it's got a, a gray tag, which is no priority, um, we just get it done uh, within a timely fashion. And those priorities change daily as we have stand up meetings every day to assess priority on our tasks. And then of course, number seven, who is it assigned to? We typically only assign a task to one person. Um, we typically only assign a task to one person. Um, they're in charge of making sure that the whole thing is completed. Uh, subtasks we assign to other people on the team. So hopefully that answers your question. It does, and it, and it provokes a lot more. So, <laughs> <laughs> cool. what, what what I would love to talk about is uh, yeah. the estimation of the tasks because that mm -hmm. is, as you've said, it's very important to have an idea of how long it will take to complete a task. But also, it's one of the hardest things that I found, at least in my experience, is to to properly estimate how long a task will take. So. What are some of the tips that you can give our viewers on better estimating the, the task durations? So um, I'm going to talk about documentation in a little bit. Um, one of the things I had to really practice, and I had to really, really, really practice this. Like It was hard for me to slow down and figure out how long it takes for me to do tasks. And in doing that, um, I also made it a made it mandatory for myself to actually document my tasks. So what I did was when I started creating our SOPs um, and our documentation, I actually timed myself. So on every single um, SOP that I've written, on the bottom I put estimated time. And what I did was I time tracked myself to complete that task and the time it took for me to write the SOP. Um, and then I would practice it a few times um, and time myself. Uh, as I followed the instructions. And so that's how I look at the time estimation. So it, it kind of gives whoever is working on the task a little bit more, um, like a little bit of a buffer. Um, so if someone's taking a lot longer on the task, you can you can assess it like, is it because we're not providing enough information? Um, and that's usually the case. It's usually uh, communication issues. Um, or if we just really don't know what goes into uh, the time estimate. Now, if you haven't written an SOP, uh, I recommend that you um, take your best guess and then go back and analyze it. Are people spending way more time than they should on these tasks? If they are, then you kind of got your answer. Um, you need to maybe write an SOP because maybe people are doing it a hundred different ways, lack of standardization. Um, and, or you just really have no idea what goes into that task and you need to reevaluate it. You're probably undercharging um, for it and blaming it on scope creep. That is really, really helpful. And then one, one last thing I would love to touch upon before I let, let you continue with the presentation okay. is um, the aspect you said, uh, you have daily meetings to assess priorities. Mm -hmm. How do you set those priorities? Is this ba based on project budget and timeline, a combination of those two, or what metrics do you use for that? Sure. So um, we use some version of Agile. Um, and that opens a whole another can of worms for those of you that have development <laughs> agencies. Um, so we use some form of agile. Agile, in my humble opinion, don't throw your pitchforks at me, does not work for marketing. It works great for software development. It works great for web development. It works great when you're working on one project. But for marketing, things move so quickly. There's so many unknowns and variables within, even within this hosting a webinar. Like, yeah, it's the same process every single time, but there are variables that change constantly. Um, with these things. Amara, oh, right? mm -hmm. that's exactly what we were saying last week with our uh, guest, Beth Livingstone, who was saying the same, that Agile is good for software, but not really good for uh, our purposes, even for website designers, it's not. So yeah, second time. You know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I've modified Agile in my agency. Um, so we take some parts of it um, that do work. So we do do what we call sprints, but we only, we don't do them once a every two weeks or once a month we do them or i'm sorry our sprints aren't bi-weekly or monthly they're weekly actually because again um things happen so quickly in agency world so um when we i created filters um a filter so that every single thing uh falls within a sprint week so we manage 40 clients 40 something clients every single task for 40 something clients divided up in sprint weeks and so we use a board view to manage that. And so every day we go over that board view and assess uh, priority 
And it helps us to ensure that A, all the tasks are there, they're in the right spot, and that tasks are moving forward without any blocks. Um, so we do a, a daily stand up, it's about 15 minutes. That's very helpful. And I, I think um, uh, the more you do these daily stand ups, the, the faster you get with those. And it's mm -hmm. easy, from my experience, to clutter yourself in, the, in those meetings and to get lost in details on all the projects and the tasks that get delayed and stuff like that, talking about why they get delayed instead of just moving on, noting it's shifting priority, moving on. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how do we keep those, those meetings efficient? Um, we've kind of modified our stand-up a little bit. Um, it's, I'm still trying to perfect it. Um, I usually provide some sort of state of the union that really goes over, like mostly on Mondays, um, and that's the beginning of the month or the beginning of the quarter, um, establishes the goals for the week, upcoming projects, um, major bottlenecks, like if there's things that just aren't moving like they should um, from a high level. And then I have my team report to me where they're at with things. And then I just write, we, I, I make an executive decision like, okay, uh, where's the block? How do we get through it? Um, do we need to have a side meeting? And then we set up time to go through that separately. Um, you know, and when we get really busy, I've, sometimes get lazy and I don't want to do the standups and I'll say, Hey, um, we're not going to do one today, but it really affects the team after so many days of not doing a standup because priority gets shifted. They don't really see the impact of not getting things done on time or having things wait or not being efficient or not communicating efficiently. And so those standups really help people see that the log, like where the log jams are and also see where there's opportunities where other team members can jump in and help and, and things like that. So, um, I think having a standard, having your standardization of your standups can help, like having a protocol. Okay, so what happens when something's blocked? Um, what happens when someone doesn't have enough work to do? What happens when these things happen? So you're constantly evaluating your standup process and streamlining it for, for your organization um, so that you're communicating uh, at a high level um, and not getting too granular on those calls. Like, Sometimes during those calls, I'll determine, hey, I need to do a full on training on this because it's just there's all kinds of chaos happening. Um, <laughs> like we I'm have, glad, glad you're yeah. bringing that up, that it's happening for you as well, being the expert here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Like I, I determined yesterday, I was like, man, like we use HubSpot, right? We're a HubSpot certified agency. And so there's all these questions. I'm like, OK, we just need to do a training. Like these, these can all be demystified if I just show you the how, who, what, when, where, how and why versus me just you know, writing an SOP on it. I think we need to, sometimes it's just a matter of additional training um, in some areas. I think standups can really help you identify those areas uh, where your team might just need, need to understand what we're doing more. Yeah, love it. All right, let's continue with the presentation. I'll keep my questions for now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no worries. I think we're making good time. All right. So we talked about folder structure uh, based on one of your questions. So that's great. So problem number three is a disconnect between billing and productions teams. Okay, so even if you're not a uh, agency, let's say you're a marketing department, and I've worked with marketing departments as well on uh, implementing and optimizing ClickUp, um, there can even still be a disconnect between uh, departments um, and things like that. So this is actually really important, even whether you have clients or not, or you're a solo agency or a solo practitioner, right? Um, I think. Uh, one of the things that I find has been an issue of my agency is how to get the time tracking to connect. So if you're doing dealing with sprint points, how to get that to connect. Um, and so having that standardization, like we like I said before, and having um, some sort of uh, matchup or match uh, where you can kind of connect projects on the production level to how clients are billed and how you submit your contracts to your clients so that um, you can hire a business manager or hire an administrative person to take care of those things. Um, especially when you're working with bigger companies, they all have different billing needs, right? Like if you're doing RFP, if you work with uh, municipalities or big companies where you're uh, billing based on uh, requirements to fulfill an RFP or something like that, uh, where you're billing 30, 60 days out or what have you, um, those have different billing requirements. And you know, one of the biggest pet peeves I have with agencies is forcing your clients to fit your mold just to make your life easier. Last time I checked, we're here to make our clients' lives easier. And yes, um, there is a gray area, um, but 
with some of our bigger clients, like I would lose a lot of those clients if I forced every single one of them to pay 100% up front. I mean, yes, I do have um, some stipulations to protect my company um, or what have you, but we do have some instances where we have clients that don't fit within our billing model. So we have to uh, be agile and uh, make that work. And so having standardization for how we set up our projects and have them match our billing so that my um, business manager who I was able to hire because I had these systems in place can see uh, what needs to be billed to what, especially as new projects come in and as new contracts happen, um, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, and then again, you can actually run reports. You can actually run project P&Ls. Um, you can actually run uh, different things to ensure that you're actually being profitable um, with these projects when you have these things connected properly. I sense, I see a question or you're deep thinking <laughs> that is happening right now. <laughs> I see chin yeah, rubbing. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking how to phrase this because there is, um, it, it, as you said, there is a serious disconnect bet between the accountants and, and the, let's say, software developers or website builders or something like that. They have two totally different perspectives on the project. Right. And uh, as you've uh, touched upon earlier, there is, for example, a difference between building for retainers and building for one-off projects and the importance of separating the two and on the production side, being aware of what you are doing, even though the tasks merge sometimes and what you do for the retainer also impacts the project and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that there's a lot of uh, talking needed in terms of getting the mindset on, on the production side correct, but also uh, educating the billing department on how the production works and why things shift and merge sometimes. I'm not sure where I'm going, if that's really a question. I just had this come into my head right now. I think I know where you're going with it. Um, so this is, again, going back to standardization, right? When you have everything all in one spot, if you just have like, you know, your graphic designer making a task because you just saw, shot him a thing, hey, can you make this for me in Slack? And he's like, sure thing. And then you he makes his own, he or she makes their own task um, or there, what have you, make their own task. And then from a billing standpoint, they're just going to throw it into the space for the client without regard yep. to where it gets billed. So then you're now either not billing for that thing because you included it in a retainer and so on and so forth. So there's, there's just no standardization. And so my production team is not concerned with billing. I mean, they're concerned with billing their hours, not but not necessarily the client's billing, which is why we don't really let our productions team create tasks we have those tasks created by project managers that understand the structure of the agreements with the clients um, for that reason as well. And so, um, and so otherwise, if you have those different projects, it's impossible to separate them um, and to run those reports on those projects. And so I think the philosophy here is to uh, make sure that you separate the billing um, on, a, on a project level from the beginning so that you're properly allocating, um, you know, budget to those things. And then even if those tasks don't aren't associated with the with the project or a contract or what have you, it's a red flag to say, hey, we need to build. We need to figure out how we're going to build this client. We need to either send them an invoice. You know, um, it's just a, it stops people in their tracks instead of just doing work without um, any regard to the administrative side of it later. Um, just a whole yeah. slew of issues that come up when you don't have these systems in place. And you yeah, go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I've been through these issues. That's why it came up to me. <laughs> and it's hard to articulate it, right? It's hard yeah. to articulate like why it's a problem because it's like it's just an enormous, like I don't even know how to describe it. It's just enormous. It's it's a lot. The enormous be a moth of a situation. Yeah. Yeah. It it just it's almost just like an immovable thing. Like it doesn't, it's almost like you can't fill or you can't handle your administrative side without it being connected. Like, which is why it's hard to even ask questions about it because it just you're just flying by the seat of your pants and hoping it works. Otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, but I think you've you've nailed the description with the example that you've given. So thank you so much for that. Sure.
All right. Oops. All right. Problem number four. Everyone's a project manager and no one's a project manager. OK, so I'm going to break this down a little bit. One of the questions I ask agencies if I work with them is, what's your project management methodology? They usually say none. I use Trello or none. I use my emails or none. I use blah, blah, blah. So there's actually project management methodologies out there or um, just methodologies in general that you're trying to fit within. And I'm not saying necessarily that you have to take those and adopt those, but um, they're really great frameworks to work within um, so that your team understands the what, how, and why, right? So like whether you're gonna use getting things done for yourself or you're gonna use Scrum or Agile to manage your projects or, or anything like this, having a like understanding at least some of the project management methodologies out of there and kind of where you fall and which ones you favor even if you don't use them completely or intimately um help especially if you're hiring new people and you're trying to expand your team and you're bringing people on and you're saying hey are you familiar with getting things done are you familiar with, familiar with agile are you familiar with the pomodoro method like whatever there's there's tons of them out there um start looking into some that might provide some framework for you and how you approach um you know, the way that you get things done. Um, like I use getting things done for my personal project management, like task management, right? And there's a huge difference between task management and project management folks. Um, and I use getting things done for myself. Um, I, too. I use agile, scrum, some version of it, my own weird concoction of it for my team and managing my company, right? Um, and so with that, when going back to what I've been saying, for the majority of this presentation, when you have your, you know, uh, production people doing quote unquote project management, um, they're gonna manage your projects like they manage tasks, which is the way they wanna do it. Um, and so they're not looking out for your project budget. They're not looking out for the administrative side. They're not looking out for when to start it, when it's due. They're not looking at workload. They're not looking at utilization. They're not looking at all these different things. So when everyone's so what I one of the often often one of the things I find is that when everyone's a project manager or quote unquote task manager, right? No one is a project manager, right? No one's managing um, expectations. So I see this all with a lot of small agencies that can't afford to hire a full time small project manager, um, and even some of the ones that do have full time project managers. Um, so project management, quote unquote, is a very for whatever reason, it's still very nebulous. Um, I feel like everybody approaches it very differently and has different expectations, um, which is very strange to me because there's full on certifications out there for these things that you will pay tens of hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars to do. But I, I find in interview project managers that really have no clue um, or just aren't up to speed on um, project management for agencies. Um, I tend to find that, and I'm ranting here, I'm sorry, but I tend to find that like I'll meet project managers that don't actually know how to do any of the stuff that we do as an agency, um, which is mind boggling to me because I don't understand how they'd be able to optimize a process. If you've never run an ad campaign or don't know what goes into running an ad campaign, um, that might be a very tough uh, a job for them to be able to manage. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to know how to you know, code or do programming. I manage major app builds all the time and I don't know. Um, I, I know how to code. I've built um, at Sephora and I've worked on teams, so it makes it a lot easier for me to manage those projects, but to just come in cold and not even understand what goes into it, that does that just is a recipe for disaster. Um, and so again, not having someone own the project and the result of the project not only impacts your project quality, but you pretty much have the blind leading the blind in all in all areas. Um, and I, it's it's such a huge issue for agencies in marketing teams alike, um, when you really don't have the right person in these roles and you don't have um, responsibilities clearly defined, like the project manager is the only one allowed to delegate, is only allowed to project plan, um, is the one that's in, you know, in charge of you know, inputting all the things and making sure that we have client checkpoints um, built into our projects and all these other things and finding ways to be more efficient and provide better service and streamline communications with the team and so on and so forth. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And it's funny that you also use uh, getting things done. It shows that I'm not on the completely wrong track with that methodology. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, one thing that stood out to me is the difference between project management and task management. Mm -hmm. I've never saw I, I never saw those two as two different things. I always thought that for some on some magic way, getting things done would allow me to manage my projects. And then I struggled with juggling multiple things at the same time because getting things done is just a, you, you pile up stuff and then you sort it through essentially and you you act delegate or, or archive on, on what's coming in um that's my from managing jan <laughs> well <laughs> task management allows you to deal with the day-to-day -day. project management yeah. allows you to deal with the big picture it allows you to also incorporate other team members into that uh, big picture task management does not um, task management helps you get things done and helps you be more efficient, right? And helps you stay organized. And everyone should have a personal task management methodology that they use. You should, everyone should have a personal note-taking methodology that you use so that you're being efficient about note-taking, um, you know, writing down ideas, you know, questions, action items, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of different ways to optimize these different things. Um, but that does not make for project management that does not make that does not help you optimize your budget with your client that does not help you troubleshoot issues it doesn't help you mitigate communications issues um, it doesn't help you manage risks within your project um, it doesn't help you do a lot of things so um, i had a really hard time trying to find a project man management methodology and i one day was just like i really like getting things done because it helps me but this doesn't help my team right they yeah. can implement this and use it for themselves but you know, having to look at things globally and holistically, um, some version of Scrum slash Agile works best for me. Yeah, for um, for those people who are not familiar, can you briefly walk us through getting things done? Because it, it came up quite a bit, but I'm not sure if everybody who's watching this uh, webinar is familiar with the methodology. Yeah. So um, my old boss used to, or not, she was my boss, but she was also my coach and mentor. Um, she would always say, if you have if you see a piece of paper on your desk and you move it three times, that means you need to either throw it away, take action on it or schedule it. Um, because back in the day before emails were a thing, you'd actually have like physical paper on your desk and you just shuffle it around a million times and, and try to get around to it. <laughs> so that's one way to explain it. Another is um, for those of us that like to use our inbox as our to-do list or multiple inboxes as our to-do list, the whole idea is to get out of a state of overwhelm and to you know not have a million things in our head um and to put things on a shelf right so you go through all of your inbox at the beginning of the day only like two or three times a day depending on your how your work day works right go through your inboxes um delete the stuff that you need to get rid of or archive it um uh the stuff that needs action um make a list of it or at least this is how i do getting things done make a list of it um and schedule it make sure that there's you block off time in your day to address those those things, whether in chunks or depending on what it is, or if it's something that takes longer than an hour, um, schedule it as well. Um, and it just makes your life a lot easier because you're not trying to waste all kinds of brain space trying to think about all the things you forgot. Um, so getting things done is just a methodology to get things done. At the beginning of your day, you have your day already planned out because you did it the night before. Going through your inbox is just to ensure that you set expectations going through all your inboxes, whether it's text messages, slacks, uh, Google mail, whatever. Um, this is just to make sure that you've actually taken the time to uh, schedule out the things that you need to do um, so that you're not missing anything. Um, or if someone expects something done within a certain time frame, you're not, um, you're able to, you know, run interception or interference on that. Sorry, not interception, run interference on that and make sure that you can reset those expectations. So it's just a way for you to take control of your day and your time versus letting your inboxes um, take a hold of you, which is really, it's it's totally possible if you're in an agency. <laughs> 100%. Uh, what, one of my former uh, bosses said that uh, I think she had the inbox open 24-7 in in the browser tab which was mm -hmm. ludicrous to me and it, she was getting disrupted like every five minutes with an email she jumped on and then i i try to convince her to not do this anymore because as you said you're touching so many things multiple times and you're wasting so much brain space thinking about what is lurking in your inbox that you didn't take care of yet 
but she said that uh, she needed to do this because um well, how did she phrase it? Uh, she, we, we were a marketing agency and she said that she had to be on top of what the customer says because the customers would often bring in last minute changes into projects and then she would have completed the project without implementing that change that came in just in that very minute when she had the inbox open. And that's what, that was her reason to keep the inbox open 24-7. Uh, I didn't manage to convince her otherwise. <laughs> it sets a terrible precedent because if people expect you to be answering your emails within five minutes, the minute you don't, it it's awful. I answer my emails once or twice a day, not because I don't want to. I'm just in meetings all day. Um, yeah. You know, so if, if that were my reality where I'm in meetings all day, um, even when I don't have a day full of meetings, I still schedule hour to an hour and a half blocks where I tell my team, hey, I'm offline for an hour and a half so I can tackle this massive list or this thing that's going to take me eight hours to do i need to start taking chunks out of it because i don't have eight hour blocks to do projects um in my day i don't because everybody has questions and stuff so um you know that's how you create a little bit of time liberty and create some balance and create some boundaries um when you do have a methodology of getting things done and when you say hey i only check my inbox three times a day um people will understand that um and if if, yeah. the, if the excuse is that oh they sent me a change well maybe um, maybe the the project management method just isn't isn't sound and yes I know people have people send over changes all the time that's it's not what I'm I'm not saying that that's not a good thing but if you have to be on your email every five minutes to make sure that a change doesn't happen then it should be so, like a couple pieces of text it shouldn't be like full on you know yeah. labor intensive things. Yeah, I agree with you. My my reasoning was that even when you check in emails three times a day, that is that like a three hour delay roughly. Given given on on a on a regular work day, it's it's not even three hours between the checks. So I don't see why that would not be enough. It should be. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's almost not enough for me because I just have a ton of emails and a ton of messages <laughs> I have to answer. But you know. Um, the more emails you answer, the more emails come back. So if you even give people some time to simmer on some things, um, you know, sometimes it takes me an hour just to check them. And sometimes it takes me another hour just to email them back. And sometimes I have to, you know, set aside time during my next block of time to actually just respond to emails and I even check the new ones. So I have yeah. so many or Slack messages or what have you. Um, or I'll just email someone and say, hey, my next time to answer emails is X time. I'll get back to you. Um, at 9 a.m. the next morning or what have you. But that's how you protect your time. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll just never, I would never get anything done, that's for sure. Yeah, well, we know lots of people. Mm -hmm. We know lots of people who um, only check email twice a day. I think, uh, yeah, and I think Mike Killen, I think he only checks it once a day, not even twice. Yeah. And, you, yeah. and, and there's an autoresponder that says, I got your email. Be aware that I only check my email once a day so that people don't expect an immediate response because that way you're just being, it's not being proactive, it's, it's being reactive. And if you react, you don't manage, you just, you micromanage and you just put out fires, but you don't actually get to the big stuff. I yeah. think, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying all this because I've been very much, uh, you know, like that, just answering straight away. I'm like, no, don't. No one's going to die. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, uh, fundamentally, no one is going to die. So, yeah. They better not. They better not. <laughs> cool. All right. I'll go on to the next one. All right. And last but not least, we have lack of documentation and systems. It is so important to create a culture of documentation in your agency or marketing department or what have you. I say this because I tried to be the champion of documentation in my agency, and it didn't work. Um, things changed so fast. We had to create a culture of documentation. Like it is everyone's job to document. I remember um, I had an employee once tell me, uh, do I get paid more for documentation? That's not part of my job description. Well, now it's on everybody's job description because guess what? When you're sick, if, if someone's sick and you need people to fill in for that person um, and every, that knowledge is stuck in someone's head and it's going to take 
a whole day for them to just download a bunch of knowledge about what a client needs or how something works or how a web update gets done. That's completely inefficient and unacceptable. As we implement new systems, we document them because if you need to be able to delegate it, you got to be able to doc. If it needs to be delegated, it needs to be documented, period. And so um, I always tell people when we do something new or do something specific to a client, I always add either a subtask or a checklist item. Hey, please document this before we close this out. Um, another thing I didn't mention is that only the project leader, project manager is able to close out a task. And that's because I want to make sure we collect all source files and I want to make sure the documentation's there for how they did it. So that if I or someone that needs to jump in and triage, troubleshoot, whatever, and handle something later, um, I know that I'm not going to waste an hour trying to figure out how they did it. I can just jump in and get it done. Right. And that's part of their review. Like, are they providing clear documentation on how they do things? Um, I use an app that helps us with documentation. It integrates with Slack. And I I think the biggest like lure for me to use that app more is that it tells me how many times people view my documentation and how much time it saved me. So every time I see, wow, my documentation is reviewed 300 times in the last couple of weeks, that's 300 less Slack messages on, hey, how do I do this? That's 300 less times something got screwed up because they missed a step. So um, we're talking about project management here, so forget efficiency, right? Lack of documentation, I don't know how anyone, going back to my first point, including myself, sets up any project management system without having your systems documented. You don't know the steps, if you can't identify the steps that it takes to, um, complete a task, building your task out is gonna be next to impossible. Um, yeah. ClickUp has fantastic tools within it, right? So they have task templates. A lot of those tools have it. Task templates, you have estimates, um, all those different things. If you actually take the time to document your systems, you can create templates. So every time you create, let's say I use the webinar example. Every time I create a webinar, it takes me four seconds to create a webinar task with all the 20 subtasks and all the um, due dates already ready to go. All the, um, if it's for a specific client, I can have all the assignees already in there. So it streamlines my task creation too. Um, but I can ensure that it gets done right the exact same time every single way. And if I need to make a small modification between clients, I can make those modifications. Um, sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I do, but let's uh, go ahead with your point right there. I look at yeah. The words. yeah, that was my biggest problem. If you take nothing away from this presentation, it is not the system that you're using. It's your lack of systems. It doesn't matter how many times and how many different um, project management apps you try to use, you're gonna blame it on the system not working. Oh, it doesn't do utilization. Oh, it doesn't do blah, blah, blah. No, if you don't have documentation or systems, your people can't find their tasks, they don't know how to do them, whack. Get your systems documented, get your documentation in place, and then try to put your, um, project management system. You can't assess a project management system. You don't have systems. Your project management system isn't, wasn't created to put systems in place within your organization. It's there to manage your systems. And so, you know, signing up for Mavenlink or Rike or Excello or whatever does not automatically put systems in place for your business. All it does is that just give you a piece cool. of software. <laughs> Right, but I that think that's the expectation. Because cool. when you look at these sales pages, beautifully written, by the way, by all these marketers, you're promising streamlining, efficiency, with the assumption that people know this, that they have their systems in place. 90% of agencies that I talk to do not have a single thing documented or any kind of system. So every time they hire somebody, they're you know assuming that everybody does everything the same way, which 100% of the time is never the case. Right, <laughs> so that is um, so true. Um, I I just I well, I have to confess that documentation is my my weakest part as well in the business that I run. However, I started uh, documenting the processes around virtual events, hosting virtual events, and all that's to it, and that is so much work. It is so much work. I I could take like two months off to document the entire processes that go into it. Um, so the the struggle that I see, not just fr from my situation, but from <coughs> my friends that I'm speaking to, is how do you balance that? How do you take time off of being productive to document? 
Um, baby steps. Honestly, um, it was hard. It's hard for me even today. So I mandate that my team helps with documentation and keeping things up to date. So if they notice that one is not up to date, like they point out, hey, this process was wrong. I fixed it. Um, or they'll leave a comment on a on a uh, a card or whatever that we have. Say, hey, this needs to be updated. These screens no longer match <laughs> the screenshots or whatever the case may be. Um, so we've created that culture. So if you're by yourself and running your own business, um, if you can't write something down, the next time you do something, hook up some sort of video recorder and just record yourself doing it at the very least, right? Um, a lot of times, it's very little things like we do ads for our clients, right? So one of the things that ends up happening is um, how do I, you know, hook up your business manager? How do I, uh, you know, give you access to Google Analytics or how do I do? Those are little things that you constantly email your clients, depending on what kind of services that you're providing. Write it down, put it somewhere so that you have it at the ready. Those little things, as you start to save little minutes here and there, so that you don't have to like type it all out every single time, you start to understand the value of your documentation, even if it's just for you. Um, so like maybe you're setting up a new Zoom account or maybe you're setting up a new landing page. It's going to help you remember all these little steps because I'm sure every time you don't do every step. And so, um, you know, so going through it as a mental check is good, too. What I started doing is exactly that I was starting when I know that a task that I'm doing, first of all, I need to remind myself if I don't do it for another couple of months, but like for instance, building a funnel to sell, sell a course. But if I know that I don't want that one day I want someone else to be doing it, then I just get Loom out, you know, Loom or anything else that can record a screen and I do it. And as I do it, I record it. Therefore, I'm not actually taking any time out to document it because mm -hmm. I am recording it as I am actually carrying out the task. So, and then I have a folder. In, I have a folder in Loom which is for it's marked processes for uh, third part, you know, employees, and and um, that really works because then I can just pass it on, and other people will know. That's the way I've been doing it. Which then you can ask when you hire someone, you can ask them, can you please also. Uh, turn it into a transcript as well, you know, put the put it put it into bullet points rather than just a video. Okay. Then someone else can do that bit for you because you've mm -hmm. done the big thing. But you haven't actually lost, so to speak, any time because you were actually carrying out the task as you as you were documenting. Right. And I, I often like break it out into little mini documents. Like doing a whole webinar, I don't necessarily do like one big video i will break it up like okay here's how we plan it here's all the steps confirm the date here's how we confirm the date that's an easy one here's how we uh confirm here's all the information we need to collect from the person right their bio their headshot their description where their bullet points uh send it to the graphic designer here's the specs here's the specs for the, the assets that we need so that you're not missing them every time and having to go back and forth with your graphic designer a million times so now you translate that to your project management system to make sure that that's in place. So now it's officially streamlined. Um, so now we are incredibly efficient at hosting webinars and doing podcasts and doing blogs and all these other things. And it just keeps getting better and better because we just keep adding to that system. So not only does it make us more efficient, we keep providing a better result as we go along and we just keep adding to it. Um, so just start, honestly, just start somewhere. Just start with like the five things that you constantly have to keep telling Every time someone asks you how to do something, instead of just showing them, document it. Start go start there too. Um, just start doing it, and you'll start to see the reward of it um, eventually. Promise. Love it. That that takes a lot of pressure off everybody's shoulders, I think, because it is when when you think about all the stuff you do on a daily basis, and then imagining yourself writing the documentation for all of that, it's like this va vast amount of text that you have to create or videos that you have to record, and by just breaking it down, I think you've removed the excuse to not start with documenting. Right, and I I even cheat sometimes, like. If it's something like setting up Zoom or setting up a Facebook page, if you Google how to set up a Facebook page, copy and paste it, 
and then add your flair to it and call it a day. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, some of that stuff's already out there. Uh, just add whatever nuances or touches you want to it um, as a starting point. Love it. All right. I know we only have a few more minutes left. So um, did you have any more questions? I'm just going to throw my slide up in case anyone wants to stay connected or has any additional questions. Um, we don't have any other questions in the chat coming in right now. I think you've covered a lot of ground already. I'm just going to <laughs> the questions that, that I've uh, set up myself, but we've covered most of them. Um, I just want to want to thank you for coming on and maybe take a minute to to recapitulate and to summarize what we've been through. So we've talked about software fatigue in the first section of the talk, which was uh, essentially searching for a solution you're not knowing the problem for because you don't realize that you didn't create didn't document and didn't set up all the processes and that you are just searching for the for the magic tool that does that for you which unfortunately doesn't happen um we talked about the lack of standardization which ties into the documentation conversation as well as the importance of having everybody on the same page in terms of how you do things and what has to be done in which form by by whom when and so on we talked about the definition of the minimum viable task which was a very important slide, I think. So definitely something I'll have to check out in the in the aftermath and watching the replay. We talked about having a consistent project structure. You shared that you use the spaces in ClickUp for the clients. Then you have folders for projects and you have lists for various tasks and task types or services. Mm -hmm. um, we have the disconnect between billing and production and you shared that project managers should be the only ones creating tasks, not the production people. Um, we do have a blog coming in. Thanks for sharing that. I'll just put that up onto the onto the presentation right here. So this is a blog post that um, I highly recommend everybody to check out because it just dives deeper into what we've talked about already. And it goes to show that ClickUp might be a good tool for you to check out if you're on the verge of uh, going into a new tool. That is actually the one question I have left open before uh, we, we can we can finish this presentation, that is, at what point is it worth to shift the tools? Because imagining that you have like 100 projects in your current management tool and you are not happy with it, but, but the, the stuff just accumulated over time, it is quite an effort to change the tool. Mm -hmm. What What's the tipping point? by when the, the benefits of the new tool outweigh the efforts? So, um, like I said, I used every single tool. Um, let's go back to the first one. There we go. No, oh, go back. All right, I used every single tool there. Um, I think the first one was Basecamp, like 10, 11, 12 years ago, or what have you. Um, and then I used all these different other ones in between. And then I landed on teamwork for a really long time. I used proof hub for a long, a little bit. I was trying to get out of teamwork, but it was awful. Um, for me, the tipping point was when I started to see the roadmap of the things that they were trying to do completely veer away from what I needed. Um, cause no tool is perfect. ClickUp's not perfect. They're not perfect. Um, but for marketing agencies specifically, we have very, very specific needs. And when, as I started to see teamwork, for example, go into like CRM and all these other things, I'm like, make your project management tool better. Um, so for me, um, I just knew that they would never, the problems that I was having would never get solved. Everything was just completely disjointed. It was taking really, it would take me an hour just to be able to say, am I over budget on this project or under budget? And for me, it was like, I can't spend an hour across 40 different clients to answer that question. It's and true, so for yeah. and so for me, when it becomes a hindrance to be able to run your business, it might become necessary. Now with ClickUp, I can actually look at that in five minutes. I know exactly what my team utilization is. I know exactly if I'm over budget or under budget. I can see everything that I need. And so, depending on where you're at within your business, Trello might be fine. Oops, Trello might be fine. Um, you know. Uh, Basecamp might be fine, but when you start to have a bigger team and you need better insights into what's going on in your business, 
um, it might be, you might just have to bite the bullet and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that just sums it up. And um, you just have to eat that frog sometimes and you just ha have to do it. Uh, Amara, thank you so much. It, people, if you want to get in touch with Amara at Amara Reps on the social networks, and also she has her last slide coming up right now with all the contact details. So very well prepared guest. <laughs> highly appreciate that uh, Peter how can we get in touch with you I am Peter on Twitter Peter Neri on Instagram and LinkedIn very easy love it uh, if my you want to get in touch too, so <laughs> you're on oh clubhouse. nice <laughs> nice clubhouse for the win if you want to get in touch with Lee uh, just search agency trailblazer on Facebook and you'll find his amazing Facebook group highly recommend you join in it's a lovely place and if you want to get in touch with me um, I'm just starting a new YouTube channel for virtual summit mastery so give that a follow if you don't mind and reach out to me on I am Jan Koch on Twitter thank you so much for watching everybody